G'day, I'm Bruce and I'm here today to see if I can get this old Kane haul-out unit running and it's got a Massey Ferguson 178 powering it. This unit's got a lot of history attached to it. This was the first real high lift unit in our area that could lift up high enough to tip into a, tip into a semi-trailer. Before that they could lift but they could only tip into a bin that was about the same height. And the man that owned this, the man that had this specially built, he said, he went to this company and he said, can you build a tipper that will lift higher to load straight into my semi-trailer? And they said, yes, we can do it. So this is it. So this is a pretty historic machine. And this is going to go off to another farm. It's going to be saved. The family are definitely going to keep this unit and probably fix it up and hopefully keep it for a long time. Yeah, this part of the unit here was actually built in about 1971 or 1972, the owner thinks. Uh, of course the tractor is a bit older than that. This was a second hand tractor when that was being built but of course not very old at that time. Um, these tractors were probably around about 75 horsepower from memory. They had a 248 cubic inch Perkins in them which was a pretty popular motor. They used that in the 188 as well and they used it in a couple of other Massey Ferguson models too. Uh, obviously you can see it's got a hydraulic pump and everything here to work the back and it's been sitting here for a fair while. This is open on here. It should have a breather. It should have, should have a filler cap on there. That's where you fill the engine up. So I think we'll probably drain the oil that's in there because there could be water laying on the bottom, even though it doesn't really appear to have that on the stick. But we'll drain that anyway, just to be sure, because it looks like water would have to go in there, I think. We'll stick some new oil in there. If I can get that to go back in there. Many viewers will probably wonder why it hasn't got a front axle under it, but originally it did have a front axle and that was all taken out and they made it articulated. They made it so it would articulate back in this position here. If you look in here you'll see the, the turning rams are in there. And this was an idea where they could turn sharper, they could turn quicker and sharper. But the way they've gone now, tractors have got bigger, bins have got bigger. So I think they've gone away from this idea, back to, four -wheel, back to big four-wheel drive tractors and tow around bins. So that's the way they were. That's the way they used them. They never had a front axle on the front. I did hear a story one time. One of my friend's father-in-law, they had a unit like this. Sometimes they'd have, um, they'd have three farms would join in together and they would have a cane harvest and they'd have one or two of these. But anyway, it was built on a Chamberlain tractor, the same setup. And because a lot of times they're driving across rough ground, it broke the trumpet on the diff. The trumpet's the part that goes from the diff centre out to the wheel. It broke the trumpet on one side on the old Chamberlain. So they fixed that up. Anyway, they thought, oh, well, we're right now. The next year, it broke the trumpet on the other side. So then they thought, right, we're going to have to go back to a tractor that has a front axle under it. So they went back to a, they went and bought a brand new Ford 5000 and they left the front axle on it. This idea here with the hydraulics going up to this setup with the steering, this is directly feeding oil back to the rams or away from the rams. That was an idea that they had. Uh, you can see here's, here's the remains of the original steering box is still here. And I guess this piece here is mounted on the end of the where the steering wheel would have been plus braced up over here. So the original steering box is just redundant. This is the setup here where it just directs the oil in one direction or the other which is pretty, a pretty simple idea. With these turning rams here when you turn the steering wheel the rams are either just going in or out there's one here, there's one on the other side, exactly the same. And that's the way they worked. That's still in pretty good nick, that ram. I thought that was rust on there, but it must have been chromed up pretty well. There's a bit of dirt sitting on there. Maybe a little bit of a mark there. That's amazing, isn't it? Sitting out in the weather all that time, I thought that would have been really rusty. I don't really like the look of that broken off exhaust manifold, but it has got water in it, but it is down lower than the ports on the motor. So all we can hope is the water that, that should be dry, but because there's moisture in here, some of the valves could be stuck open in here. We don't know, just from the, just the fact that there's moisture in there. But we won't really know whether it's going to turn or not until we, well, I suppose until we put a battery in and touch the starter. I think it is seized. We'll go on the other side. I think it's seized. Ready to break the fan belt. When you're doing this stunt, you push in on the belt that way and you push down on the fan the same way. 
No, I think we might put a battery in it first before we change the oil and just check whether it will turn. Otherwise we might waste that 20, 10 litres of oil anyway. There's the battery there. I thought the ends might have been bulging a bit more, but we'll pull that out. We'll put one of our batteries in and just see if it will do anything. WD-40 on that terminal won't do any harm. Where am I? It's a bit tight but not too bad. I think I really need a 13. 13 slightly bigger than half inch. Rightio, I'll we'll come round here. Rightio, I'm going to place this battery put it over here out the way. Positive side goes in first. Rightio, I'm going to put our negative terminal on there. I might even give that a bit of a brush. It won't hurt to give it a bit of a clean, just grab my glove. Looks a bit better already. It's a little bit, I don't know, it feels a little bit dodgy in there. We'll see how it goes. Might have to pull that back just a whisker. I don't think that'll fit on the, no, it won't. Too fat. This is the positive. I know I'm doing it back to front. <laughs> Someone will leave a comment again. Um, I don't really want it to touch over there on the, the body, so I'm going to just have to be a bit careful what I do here. I know you will be saying, and I know I'm doing it the wrong way, I'm going to have to be careful I don't earth the spanner. Take my time. It is back to front. So make sure I don't earth that. Right here, we've got that and that. Now, we better just see if she's in neutral. The gears certainly aren't seized, are they? I'll take it, that's probably, probably in neutral. With some of these tractors, they were designed that you had to be in neutral on the high-low stick. But I'm not, I can't remember now whether Massey Ferguson's, and I know Fords were definitely like that. Masses were probably like that too, so you couldn't start them in gear unless that was in neutral. This has got an extra wide seat, which, which the fellow that owns it had, put, had that put in it. And um, this is a, these are the levers here to work the hydraulics for the back end there. Oh well, I better put that back in the central position. I probably should put a bit of spray around them. Where is it? Right, at least now we know that that's going back into its neutral position. This one here. I'm not sure whether it's stuck in or out. Oh well, we might be able to get it. Something's moving in now. Right, now see how it's springing back? <coughs> That's what we want, it's going back to the neutral position. That one's still a bit stiff, but just looking at the gauge set on here now, it's a shame the taco smashed, it would have been interesting to know how many hours it would have done. If any of these old things could talk.
I'm just going to see whether it will turn over or not on the key. Well, here goes. No, looks like that's dead. So we'll go around and try and short across the solenoid and see if we can engage the starter that way. I'm just going to rig up this wire on this button on the solenoid. It may even have to have an earth. Some of these older solenoids, they had to have an earth. You'd put positive onto there and that had to be earthed. Later model stuff, they earthed back into the back into the starter motor itself. Rightio, we've got action. It is going to turn. Down on compression a bit on one cylinder, but that doesn't matter. Could be just a sticky valve or a rusted valve seat. Well, we know the motor's going to turn, which is really good. Obviously the starter motor is a lot stronger than what I am yanking on the fan blades. It's always best to use an impact socket, which is six sided and not 12. If I can get that on there. Right, uh, how tight's it gonna be? Tight, real tight. I might have to get something and put on the end of that. Right, uh, that worked, the rubber hammer. That saved damage in the chrome on the end of the on the, end, on the end of the ratchet. That grass is going to be in the way a bit there. Get this container facing the right way. Can I turn that by hand? Yeah, I can. That socket stuck on that bung, it might be a good thing. Now we're ready to see what comes out. Well, so it would have been worse. That's amazing. Usually if there's water there it'll come out first, but I couldn't I didn't see any water come out, but if we drain it out and put new oil in it, this track is going to be saved by the family. So we don't want to damage the engine in any way by you know, taking the risk about whether it's going to suck up water in the bottom and pump that through the bearings and everything. So, particularly when we're on high alert where that's been open. While the oil's still draining, we'll have a bit of a look at the diesel. It's pretty hard to clean around that. I might just see if I can get something and give that a bit more of a clean. We put the rag over there, so we're going to give it a blow with a fire extinguisher. Right, that'll make it a bit easier. I'll go around the other side in case there's any dirt laying under the lid. Wish there was. Right oh, now we know that's clean. I'll have to get something and dip it. I don't think there's anything in it. It looks like the fuel system and everything is still hooked up. They have replaced this filter here. That would have come off of there. A lot of Ford tractors and a lot of other tractors use that particular filter back through the 70s. This one here is a longer version. And obviously the fuel the fuel tap is on by the look of it. I think it's on. So we'll put some diesel in the tank and see what happens. Right, we've got the fuel doctor here. We'll give it a, a shot of the fuel doctor. If I can lean it over on something to pour it. That's about what I'm going to put in it. Tank sounds really empty. That down there. Put the lid back on. That's undone. Right here, we just jiggle that little hose up and down. 
there it goes, siphoning away. You can see the diesel coming out the other end there. I'll put that down nice and low, it'll just be a little bit quicker. Diesel, water will be next. How thirsty is this critter? We have another one. Away we go. This is the second bottle. The other bottle wasn't quite full, but. There we are. We're full this time. We know that's done. Just got to put the bung back in and pour some oil in. Well, there it is. It's pretty well stopped draining now, so we can take that out the way and put the bung back in. Soak that up. Right, I'm going to tighten the bung back up. Right, just got it. I knew it was going to be hard to get that off because it was, I tapped it on actually. Yep, very good. Now we've just got to pump the oil in now. Some will start easy, yep, I'm away. Now I'll have to loosen this off, it has a spring and a ball in the end. I'm going to have to buy a new hose. It must have a grate or something in there I'd say. Well it must be story time. I'll have to tell a story about my next door neighbour, my next door neighbours, when I was young, probably about 14, the farm next door, they were quite well off, anyway they had a couple of Ford tractors, they had a Ford Super Dexter and a Super Major and a Power Major, so anyway their father wanted them to do a bit of supposedly light clearing. So my friend, he was a year older than me, so he jumps on the Super Major and he goes down, it's got the, got the front blade on it, mounted right through underneath the chassis, right back onto the, out near the wheel, so pretty strong blade set up. Anyway, he's pushing these trees over, they weren't very big, some were only bushes, and everything was going pretty well. And I was there, and I thought, oh yeah, just doing a bit of work, they were always busy people always doing something with a tractor. Anyway, the next thing he comes across this bigger tree. I think it was a spotted gum tree from memory because it was spotted gum type country. The base of the tree was probably about that round. And that's a pretty, that's a big tree if you're on a tractor. A tractor can't usually push a tree over that big. I better just check this before I overfill it. I'll have to get a rag, this rag and wipe this off. Is that going to go back in there? There we are. 
Yep, we've only got a drop on the dipstick, so I've got a fair way to go. Yeah, so the story goes, he's on the super major, and he's determined he's going to push this tree over. He's got nearly all the rest of the bush pushed down and pushed up in the stack. So he decides, right, I'm going to get this tree down no matter what. So he's on the super major, and he just revs her up flat out. And he gets back a bit, and he's charging at this tree. And he must have had about, I'd say about 15 goes under full throttle, forward and reverse, forward and reverse. And the blade was, start, the blade was starting to bite into the tree. I thought he's going to, if he doesn't push it down, he's going to cut it down with the edge on the blade. Anyway, the next thing, he's in neutral, couldn't get it to go into gear. Anyway, that was it. I think they had to tow it back to the shed, split the tractor in half, pulled the pressure plate off, the clutch plate just fell out. All the linings just fell off the clutch plate. So that's what happened. All these things have their limitations. The moment you push them too hard, there'll be, a, there'll be some weakness somewhere along the line. That'll be the first thing that breaks. That's what happened with that tractor. Just check this oil again. It's up to about here, which is a fair bit over full. But then when you look at the lean on the machine, if the machine was leveled up, it might be about, about the right level. Next up is to bleed the fuel system. I've just got this container here. In case we spill any diesel on the ground, we've got something there to catch the diesel. This is the bleeder. I'll just go around the other side and work the hand primer on the lift pump, which is this little lever here. It's one you've got to push up. There's a little lever there on the side of the lift pump. Nearly all these old tractors had a hand primer, which was a good idea. Doesn't feel like much is happening. You can see there, it is pushing it through. So we know we're getting fuel. Now there is another bleeder on top of this filter. I'm just going to crack this bleeder here on the end of the the top of the fuel filter and if there's any air there it should come out. I'll undo that a little bit. Having a bit of trouble getting that undone. I'm sure that's the right size spanner. I hear a bit of air but not much. Yeah, it looks like a bit of solid flow of diesel, which is a good sign. I'll just keep that going while I'm give a little bit of pressure there so it can't draw air back into the system. Not too tight, we're in an alloy housing. It's firm. A bit more in there. <coughs> now it looks like we've got fuel right to there now. Not a lot, but that's probably enough. Depending on where the engine stopped, the lever on the fuel pump, the load on the cam might be right at the peak of the turn. And that means when you work the lift pump, you're hardly getting any stroke. And then if you turn the engine around about a turn and a half, and instead of the load being like that, here's the lever on the fuel pump. Once the lobe comes around like that, you always get more stroke on the manual pump. We'll hook our start button back up now. If I can find somewhere there to hook onto. Right, this is a throttle here, it's been disconnected. And I'm pretty sure that's full power. I might just crack them. What is that? No, this one here will be the other bleeder. It doesn't seem to be doing a real lot. I thought it would have been doing better than that. I don't know why that is. I thought it could be turning over a bit quicker than what it is. 
with these Lucas starters, I have seen them before where they've where the bottom brush, there's a brush here and a brush here and a brush there and a brush there, the bottom brush spring can rust off. So that means if that brush is not doing anything, that brush is not doing anything. So that means effectively the starter motor goes back to half power. And it should be just spinning over a bit quicker, I feel. So I'm going to try and do another trick where we have a second battery. We don't know. This lead could be crook up in here where it goes onto the lug end. Could be crook down there. So if I can just go straight onto this lug, if I can get that on there somehow without it. Right then, I'll put that onto there. We'll put our positive on here. Then if I can get an earth somewhere on the starter, maybe around that around the backing plate there's normally pretty good. The other thing that can happen too, some of the brushes are actually earthed to that backing plate. When you get up into trucks into big starter motors, they've got a designated pole right right where the brushes are, right where the this setup here, the earth has got to come down, go onto here, then the earth has got to work its way through this housing, I think there's a spacer there, through that, through the body, and through this back here. So any one, I will say one, maybe two, three places. If there's corrosion around where that starter motor bolts together, it'll, it'll be weak. So if we put the earth right onto there, the positive right onto there, we know we should be getting more power than through the leads. There is a strainer down inside here, so the rag won't get chewed up by any gears or whatever. So we'll just put that in there. Won't push it down too far. I've got the second battery hooked up now. Where I've sort of got, well, I've got leads. It's original leads, plus I've got these other leads running directly to the starter. So we'll see if that spins over any quicker. There's our throttle there. Spring, I've been turning and turning it. It's very close. There it is, I've got it. Must have turned it about a dozen turns. Now I don't know whether I can actually work a spanner because it's got the fuel tank up above it. Not that way. Maybe. Just maybe this way. Yeah, a bit of air come out. Maybe a bit of air in the system, maybe. One thing about these, because there's diesel there, they always come undone without too much trouble. That one's going to be a bit more awkward. I'm going to be up against that. Oh no. Mr. Perkins left a bit of, bit of room there. This last one, if I can get it, it's probably going to be the hardest one out of the bunch. Oh no, there we are. Where are we? I'm going to crank it down here. I'll have it wide open throttle. I'm pretty sure that's full throttle that way. whisk them all in a bit of a tap. Sometimes they can be seated on there pretty hard. There is diesel just starting to come through at the injectors but it's pretty weak even under full throttle. There's not a lot coming through. So I don't know whether whether the lift pump is a bit weak on it, or whether one of the, one of those fuel filters could be partially blocked. But I'm just going to spray a bit of Aero Start. Here it's got a rust hole in the air cleaner, which is probably the easiest place for me to squirt a bit in. We'll see what happens. I'll 
just see if I can open up these couple of bleeders here and then go around and see if there's any air in the system. Right. Yeah, yeah. Well, the motor's probably stopped in the right place now. I'm just going to check this here again. Let's see if there's any air. No, it looks all right. I'm sure that's all right. I'm sure that's got diesel coming to it. Screw that back down. Not really. That's what they call a banjo fitting. See how it wraps around like a banjo? The bolt goes through the middle and the bolt's actually the centre of the bolt's drilled out and has a hole in the side of the bolt. A lot of, a lot of English cars had banjo fittings on their carburetors. Looks okay. That looks okay too. I'll try that, see how much. We know we've got plenty of diesel getting from the tank to the pump, for the injector pump. Um, I might try closing those lines off and just see if that does anything at all. Yeah, we should have more fuel coming out of these injector lines. I suspect there could be something wrong with the injector pump. Quite hard to get on that one. Right, oh, I'm pretty sure there's plenty of diesel getting to the pump, so I suspect there might be something wrong with the injector pump because there should be more diesel than that squirting out around the injectors. So I'll give it another shot with the arrow start. situation is I think the lift pump this is actually the lift pump here I think it's working pretty well it looks like there's enough diesel flowing through those two filters it looks like we've got enough diesel coming out of the inlet pipe going into the injector pump but it looks like we just can't get enough we can't get the, the injector pump to pump enough fuel up to the injectors there's a little tiny bit coming out but not even enough to make it idle so I'm, give, I'm going to give it one more shot and of course it sounds like it is running but it's only running on ether so we'll give it another go.
running on ether. I know there are people out there that say, you know, ether's really hard on them. It's probably at its worst when they first fire. Once it's actually running and everything's spinning over and that, you know, the rattling doesn't sound so bad then. But you've got to remember, diesel motors are very high compression. Some diesel motors are really rattly when they're good. Other motors, if they're indirect injection, well, they don't hardly rattle at all when they start. Well, I've given it a pretty good try there today, and I don't think I can do any more. I think there's something wrong internally in the injector pump. So, uh, there was a fellow who came over before and gave us this item where it's a leg off a chair or whatever, but we've got that shoved over there to block that up so no water can get in, which is a good thing. So, that's probably about it for this video. And um, it's a shame it didn't run, but um, a bit like the bulldozer, the Fiat bulldozer, it had the same sort of problem with its injector pump. Same sort of thing, it should have ran, but no. Nah. Before we go, I'm sure some of you have had a look in the background and there's another, there's another machine in this old shed. So we'll wander in there and have a bit of a look at it. I think it's got a Chamberlain tractor on it. It's funny how it goes. A lot of these machines have got a good tire on one side and I had it tire on the other side like that one out there. They're all in either one way or the other. A few cobwebs in here. Well, look at that for a spider. I picked up part of his web, I think, when I walked past, so I must have just walked underneath him. Just looking at the old Chamberlain here. These had a six-cylinder motor, which I think was a 6306. Six-cylinder, 306 cubic inches. These were about 90 horsepower. A lot of people, I think you could even buy some of these with six 354s fitted to them. And other people got the ones like this, ripped that motor out and put a, put a truck motor in them to make them really go. Then they're always very high geared. Obviously that tyre's been flat for a long time by the look of it. But it would be interesting to see whether it would run too. The gentleman that owns this set up here, he said this used to go along beside the, beside the harvester. The cane would go into here. There's actually two separate bins here. And then when they, they would use that cane for planting cane, then all of a sudden they could tip this from this into, into their planter. And as they're going along, that plants the next lot of cane, which is going to probably last for the next five years or whatever it is before they plough it in and start again. Have a look there. You can see the exhaust is holding up that, that whole section of the shed. The exhaust is holding it there. Roof on the tractor here. Bin, cane bin over there. So the whole side of this shed has just collapsed down onto this tractor. But we might come back sometime and have another go and see if it will run. And then we might have to get some other sort of machine. It wouldn't be safe to get in that tractor and try and drive it out, that's for sure. And it has got a pretty bad tire on the other side. But it would be interesting to have a big chain or a wire rope and just tow it backwards. And I suppose all the bits of roof are going to go everywhere. But that'd be one way of getting out, probably the only way, safe way of getting it out of the shed. That'll be about it for this video, so until next time, thanks very much for watching. Just before I go, the owner of this Benout tractor has found this picture, and this is a picture of that tractor in operation possibly around about the late 80s, maybe early, maybe around about 1990 he thought. I think I might tag the thumbnail on this one, 50 years of history. There you go. That's something you don't see every day when these old machines are being rescued. So that will be it now for this video and thanks very much for watching.